What is dukkha? Cause of dukkha? You can eradicate dukkha and he gives you a formula and that's the Noble Eightfold Path. And under the Noble Eightfold Path, you have the wisdom part, which is right view, right thought. Then it talks about morality, which is right speech, right livelihood, and right, and right, life, uh, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Then about the mental cultivation, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So where is right speech? Right speech is under morality. Okay, so now, um, brother, can you help me to screen share? You pass me, yes. can make me co-host? Yeah, okay. right. Yeah. Can see this? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. I minimize. Okay. All right. We are still at right speech. Now, in the Mangala Sutta, when Adewa approached the Buddha and asked him to declare the highest blessings in life, now the Buddha listed a total of 30 things all the way from mundane blessings to the realization of the Four Noble Truths. Now, right speech is found here. Now, right speech has two sides to it. Huh? First, you avoid, abstain from unskillful speech, and then you perform. So whilst we learn from abstinence of unskillful speech, we need to learn how to have well-spoken speech. That means to be skillful in our verbal communications. We have directly seen how we can exercise restraint from unskillful speech, right? From these four, please memorize them. Now we look at how we can express skillful motivations in the right way. And now I'm doing the doing good part. For this addition, we will look at four parts. First, we will have to look at the extracts of the suttas we have seen in the previous Dhamma Bites on right speech. But these are not the only ones huh, in the Pali Canon. There are many others. We will take a look at some of the more common ones and see which one is the most suitable in guiding us on skillful communication because we always need to go back to Buddha's words. Number two, we also have to learn that speech covers more than just spoken words. Non-verbal expressions like the tone of your body, yeah? the tone of your voice and your bodily behavior and language also matters a lot. And we also look at each of the components that make up skillful speech and then how we apply skillful speech. So first, let us look at the discourses. Now, these are the suttas that we have seen so far. The suttas on the left covers what you should not do, which covers four forms of unskillful speech. And what is on the right shows how we should speak. First, we look at the discourses on speech. So what we should do is actually summarized in this sutta. Now, mantabhasa, judicious speech, uh, it means meaningful speech or thoughtful speech and is speech that is free from unnecessary chatter. So, Brothers and sisters, do we choose this sutta as a guideline for skillful communication? Now let's us explore some other suttas first. The role of speech is so important that the Buddha said in this sutta that one of the two conditions for the arising of right view is the utterance of another, Paratogosa. So most of these discourses were delivered to the bhikkhus, but these are the ones delivered to lay people. 
And this one was also delivered to a layperson, but talks about the speech of a Tathagata. Now, the Buddha does not advocate to others only in agreeable ways. He taught that those who deserve criticism should be criticized, but only with the right conditions. And these are the because they have been communicating all this time, they know what right speech is. Unfortunately, many people engage in unskillful speech without even being aware of it. With speech comes great power for good and also for harm. That is why the Buddha gave so many discourses on speech. These are just some of the more common ones. So besides the standard definition for right speech, two other suttas are very frequently quoted. Let's look at them. The first one is this. Now, Prince Abaya was a son of King Bibinsara, but not heir to the throne. At that time, he was the follower of Niganta Nataputta, who advised him to ask the Buddha this question. You can read this. Venerable sir, would a Tathagata utter such speech as would be unwelcome and disagreeable to others? Now, if the Buddha answered yes, it will prove that the Buddha was no different from ordinary people, right? But if the Buddha said no, then the prince was supposed to retaliate by telling the Buddha, but you had criticized Devadatta in the past. So what do you think Buddha said? Buddha said this, you can read this on your own. Okay, don't, don't worry, don't worry. Let me summarize. Huh? There are three main factors for the path of speech that decide whether something is worth saying, right? So very importantly, the statement must be true, whether or not it is beneficial, and whether or not it is pleasing to others. So for the Buddha, only those things that are true or beneficial are worth saying, even if it is not pleasing to others, he has a sense of proper time to say it. So based on these three factors, we have a total eight combinations, right? But the Buddha only mentioned five. So going by the principle of right speech adopted by the Tathagata, can you tell whether these three others are worth saying? First one is this, true, unbeneficial, and pleasant. Obviously, right, still not worth saying. How about this? Untrue, beneficial, pleasant. This one reminds you of what? White lies, okay? Is it worth saying? Also not worth saying. And last one, it's self-explanatory. Okay, not worth saying. So this sutta, right, is often, often used as a model for right speech. It is not wrong, but uh, you should know, right, this applies specifically to the Buddha. So we look at another sutta, which is very common. So this is the Vacha Sutta, well-spoken words. Now, the Vacha Sutta, which is also frequently quoted as being more suitable to base our practice on, although it was actually delivered to monks, uh, it is actually applicable to us as well. 
read this. The important factors of right speech are these. Must be proper time. True. Gentle. Beneficial. And spoken with a mind of kindness. How does this compare to the standard definition given earlier in the Sucharita Sutta? Remember? the Sucharita Sutta earlier. Now, let's see what the two suttas have in common. Eh? First, true, very important, gentle, beneficial. Okay. Now, the Vajra Sutta actually has two more factors. It adds in proper time and a mind of kindness, which were not found in the Sucharita Sutta. But these are mentioned in the longer versions of the standard definitions of right speech. Remember, I touched on proper timing under idle chatter, and I also touched on loving kindness under harsh speech, right? So judicious speech will cover the two elements. But the Vacha Sutta is more succinct, yet very comprehensive because it contains all the important factors of right speech. So we can see from here why it is often used to describe and to ascertain whether speech is actually skillful or not skillful. So we finished the definition. Now we move on to the next topic. Verbal communication. Now we have already established that speech is not just words. It also comes with the non-verbal part which includes the tone of our voice, facial expression, and body language. Now let's examine the five factors in the Vacha Sutta. Which of the factors are verbal and which are nonverbal? So before we go on, it is important to note that the nonverbal cues mentioned here means what? It refers to what expresses one's feelings, emotions, and attitude. These are also expressed in verbal, spoken words, but compared to the non-verbal part, it has more content. Uh, it is still more content than emotions. So this one, proper time, will mean both, right? Where both the speaker and listener are in the right frame of mind to communicate, which will influence what we say, how we say it, and how we show it. True, under verbal. Gentle, under non-verbal. Beneficial, is verbal. So how does verbal component compare to the non-verbal component? Huh? And then lastly, this one, quite clear, lah, huh? kindness under non-verbal. In the 1960s, uh, Professor Albert Marabian and his team at UCLA conducted studies into human communication patterns. Now, according to him, interpersonal communication consists of three elements. Words spoken, which is literally what is said. Intonation, how something is said. And body language, referring to posture, facial expression, and gesture someone uses. Now, which one is verbal and which one is nonverbal? Quite clear, right? Now, in the first experiment, subjects were asked to listen to the recording of a woman's voice saying the word, maybe, in three different ways to show dislike, neutrality, and like. They were also shown photos of women's face that conveyed the same three emotions. Verbal, vocal, and visual. 
they were asked to guess the emotions heard in the recorded voice, seen in the photos, and both together. And what's the result? The subjects correctly identified the emotions 50% more often from the photos than from the voice. This shows that the visual element, the facial expressions, is more dominant than the verbal and vocal elements, which is the words and tone. In the second study, the subjects were asked to listen to nine recorded words. Three to convey something nice and agreeable, three to convey neutrality, and three to convey dislike. Each word uh, was pronounced three different ways. Here we are looking at only the verbal and vocal uh, components. So when asked to guess the emotions behind being conveyed, it turned out that the subjects were more influenced by, by what? The tone of the voice rather than the words themselves. This means that the vocal element is more dominant than the verbal element. Here is a summary of the two experiments. Experiment one and experiment two. Professor Meribian combined the results of the two studies and therefore came up with this model. 7%, this is what is literally being said. The other 93% is nonverbal, made up of the tone of the voice. That means how something is conveyed and the body language. That refers to posture, facial expressions and gestures. This means that if a person dislikes something, the visuals contributed most to his dislike. So let us see examples of how these three elements express themselves. For example, here you have a verbal word spoken. Okay. So, vocal, the whisper conveys a lack of confidence, uncertainty, or even fear. How about the visual? The person here avoids eye contact, looks nervous, and she has a closed body language, etc. What a person says can be more powerful and convincing because of non-verbal actions. But if the verbal and non-verbal actions do not agree with one another, like in this case, people will unconsciously focus more on the non-verbal signals because these dominate. This model that Professor Maribian came up with in 1967 has been frequently used and also misused. People happily assumed that the formula applies to all types of communication, which is not true. Now, the 735, uh, 738-55 equation is derived from experiments dealing with feelings and attitude. Therefore, it only applies when a person is trying to convey feelings and opinions, likes and dislikes, which, brothers and sisters, basically happens very often, right? So many people have reservations about this model because they feel that it is oversimplified and subjective. But even if it exaggerates the importance of nonverbal cues, the study is a good reminder that when we communicate, we have to be very careful of not just our words, but also the nonverbal expressions because these give our listeners important clues about our thoughts and feelings and can substantiate or contradict our words. So to sum up, we have three types of communication, written, correspondence, by letters, emails, SMSs, which involve only words. Number two, speech over the phone, which involves what? Verbal and vocal communication. And lastly, Number three is face-to-face -face communication, including video conferencing, which involves all three elements. Words do convey emotions, but not as effectively as the vocal and visual communication. 
That is why uh, the worst quarrels between spouses and friends are those face to face. Harder to forgive and forget. So bearing all in mind, we now move on to the next topic. We now look at the various components of skillful speech. We have been shown that there is a lot more happening than just words. And we now know that if the verbal and non-verbal actions do not match up, listeners are more likely to believe the non-verbal signals because these dominate. However, despite this, many of us will still believe that when we put up a facade of calmness and gentleness when speaking to others, no one will know what we are actually thinking and feeling unless we tell them so. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Huh? Our thoughts and emotions can easily be perceived by people even if they are not observant or sensitive to others. This is because the way we speak and our facial expressions, gestures and posture all convey a variety of subtle signals which we may not even be aware of. Remember the face? Eyes are the windows to the soul. There are also less common saying that the face is the picture of the mind and the eyes are the interpreter. That is why skillful um, right speech uh, is a skill that has to be learned. It does not mean that we are learning the skill to hide our emotional responses, but to convey the right one. And since, and since what we think comes out in words and actions. That is why the Buddha says we speak with a mind of kindness. We always go back to the source. When we are angry, we can forget about using right speech. And because of egotism, we judge and criticize using our own benchmark of what is right and what is wrong. And our speech reflects our conceit our self-righteousness, our indignation, and consensus. So whether we like it or not, all right, there is always the ego, the I. That is why misunderstandings and conflicts often arise. So how do we relate it in a way that will avoid conflicts, minimize misunderstanding, and bring about agreement? The answer is already given earlier. The answer is meta. We will look at this first, okay, this component. Now, meta is a generosity of the heart, which gives rise to the sincere wish for all beings to be well and happy. Meta, not just for others, but also for ourselves, because it comes from within. We do not depend on others being this way or that way, doing this or doing that to make us happy. So with meta, we accept others as they are. First, we do not compare ourselves to others favorably or unfavorably, and we do not judge. It's a neutral mind. It is like this. It is what it is, a neutral mind. We don't condemn, we don't criticize, and our sense of self uh, is actually at the minimum. The mind is neutral and the mind is peaceful. Now, brothers and sisters, I take a, a um, can I just stop for a while here because someone is ringing my door. I'm in a quarantine hotel. Just give me a moment. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, I'm back. Now, matter does not arise naturally in us. We have to cultivate it by doing matter bhavana. Meditation in our everyday life. We have to watch the mind. Every time we notice ourselves judging other people, criticizing them, comparing themselves unfavorably against us to others, 
replace these negative mental states with goodwill and sincerely wish the other being or person to be well and happy. Protect the mind this way. All right? So let's not generate bad karma here by anger and hurt this mind. Don't get angry. Don't punish yourself for another person's mistake. Now, you can read this by Long Paul Sumedho. This means that the real matter is not a, a superficial feeling. It permeates our whole mind, leaving no room for negativities. A kind awareness in the context of speech uh, means that not only do we talk to others with matter, we also listen mindfully without being get caught up in our own judgment and own reaction. So what Long Paul Sumedho is saying can be found in the Sutta on the simile of the saw, which is MN21 Kakachupama Sutta. You can read this. So the second paragraph means that we listen mindfully when others speak. It is only with metta that we can readily and mindfully listen to others without judging and without getting affected. Metta forms the basis for mindful listening. So what about compassion? Compassion motivates us to reduce the suffering of others. Compassion arises through empathy, which makes us understand how others feel. And therefore, you can't have understanding if you don't have metta, right? And if you judge, you will not have empathy. And without empathy, you ain't going to have compassion. Right? So once you have these mental qualities, you will find it very easy to have mindful listening. So we have addressed loving kindness. Let's look at the quality of gentleness, which is usually associated with kindness, consideration, and friendliness. Now, these Pali words, sangha, means smooth, soft, delicate, and exquisite. These four items refer to speech that is polite and agreeable, which is smooth, not loud, nor harsh, which is soft, considerate and carefully chosen, which is delicate, and polite in behavior and manner, which is exquisite. Sometimes it is necessary to criticize or correct someone. And although we may do so with the best of intentions, it may still cause hurt. Speaking with a gentle tone and delivering our words slowly and quietly may lessen the hurt and make our words more acceptable. Unfortunately, a lot of people see gentleness as a character flaw because they associate it with weakness, which is actually ridiculous. But a strong person is one who is able to choose gentleness because he is able to see value and beauty in it. It touches people and is more persuasive. So the Buddha says here that a person who is firm and is able to get things done quickly and yet gentle, patient, and a mind of such nature is worthy of the highest respect. Rectitude here means moral uprightness or correctness. So we move on to the next factor, proper time. Now, sometimes proper time can be a simple request like this, huh, which is quite common in households. Can you please switch off the TV? I'm trying to concentrate here. Because you are in a situation where things are not going the way you want. So there may be slight irritation or frustration. So what do you do? Remember what Ajahn Suchito said? So 
before you open the mouth, what do you do? This is code is given by Ayakema, right? And then we apply Ajahn's Suchito's practice. Count to 10. Pause. Take a deep breath to calm yourself first. The choice of words is important because it is usually non-verbal signals that accompany your words that carry more weight. It could be this, right? Darling, can you please switch off the TV, please? I'm really trying to concentrate here. Now, the right moment can be 10 seconds later or even 10 months later. So without skillful speech, you will not likely get what you want. And even if you do, it is never done willingly or with goodwill. But what if the other person is not ready to listen, but you are ready to talk, and it is important to get your point across there and then? In that case, right, first you count to 10, think about what you're going to say, and you have to be prepared to handle retaliation in a very skillful way. Bearing in mind that the retaliation may have a reason because of the other person's unmet needs. So it helps to have empathy, right? And don't judge. So we will address how to talk next week. Huh? Now, we have explained this in depth huh? in earlier Dharma Bites, right? About truth. truth. So truth is an essential part of a well-spoken speech because it means that what you say, how you say it, how you show it, carry it out honestly, is your integrity. You are trustworthy and you have no blemish of a very obvious nature in your character. Without honesty, you cannot have right speech. It is that simple. So we move on to beneficial. Beneficial means a speech that helps, supports, or increases our well being and others. It creates and maintains harmony within a group. Even then, not all situations are clear cut and we have to use our discretion. Let me give you two scenarios. Let's say your father or an elderly person living with you keeps forgetting to switch off the bathroom light. So what do you do? Do you keep giving reminders? Are these reminders even delivered gently and with loving kindness at the right time. Is it considered beneficial speech? Or a friend's mother just passed away. She comes to your house to seek consolation, which means it is the proper time to say the right thing to her. Do you say this? So we will come back to these two scenarios next week. So let's look at the five factors of right speech here. Can you please memorize this? Okay. Proper time. True. Gentle. Beneficial. And spoken from a mind with no judgment. Now, these factors are interdependent. Okay? For example, if you are angry, you tend to act impulsively, right? Now, acting impulsively means not waiting for the right time to speak. And there, is no, and there is a very high chance of saying the wrong things like, you never help me with the household chores, when the word never may be an exaggeration, so it's not true. And this will make the other person defensive and resentful, which means it is not beneficial. And no matter, no gentleness, are always absent in angry speech because it comes from an angry mind. So together, these are the five factors on how we relate to one another. So we have to learn how to apply skillful speech bearing all five factors in mind. So brothers and sisters, I will stop here today and I will continue next week on the application. Okay, so I will um, switch off my screen share first. Thank you for your sharing, sister. We truly appreciate it. Um, okay, before we end today's session, we do have a question. 
some questions. We'll take a look at the questions and then we'll maybe have a quick Q&A. Is that fine with you? Okay. All right. Let's see the questions okay. from Facebook. Um, my, my Wi-Fi is not very stable because I'm in a quarantine hotel on, on, in Sentosa. So I will just switch off my video, okay? No um, worries. Yeah. Thank Hope you're you. enjoying your quarantine. <laughs> yes. Do we have any questions from Zoom? Ah, all right. There is one. Um, how to admonish someone skillfully? Okay. First and foremost, you could ask yourself, is this the proper time? Is it a proper time to do it? Which means, is that person in the mood? So if that person is very angry, right? No matter what you say to him, he will not listen. Timing must be important. So find the right timing. Second, is it true? What you're going to say true, fine. Plus, can you, are you calm enough to say it gently? Okay. And you ask yourself, what you tell that person, is it beneficial? For example, if you're in a meeting, right, with your boss and your boss is very rude, um, do you think it's beneficial in the meeting to tell your boss off because it's not okay? So, and you got to speak with a mind with no judgment, all right? So, if you are just judging the person, say, hey, you should not do this, you should do that because you don't respect the person. So, watch your mind first, huh? is it from the sense of your own ego? Look at the five factors, okay? I hope I answered your question hmm. now. Brothers and sisters, I don't really need you to go and read all the suttas. Huh? What I have done is that I've read them, summarized them, and even put on the slide so that it's for better absorption. Okay? So what you need to do right now is that to practice. To practice. So in your daily life, especially when you speak to your spouse and loved ones, pause for a while. Don't have to be 10 seconds. It can be like three or four, five, uh, and go through and go through the five factors. If you can make that as your daily practice, you'll find that it's so easy. Skillful speech needs practice, right? Yeah. All right, thank you for answering the question, sister. Yes. We will wait another maybe two or three minutes for more questions yes. to come in. Okay, maybe let me just do a sharing. Let me try the start the video. Huh? So I, I, can, I, I can, then you all can see me. Sure. Now, um, at the start of my practice, right, I started doing a lot of metta meditation because um, one of my lay teachers said that I think a lot because of my profession, I need to do metta. So do metta to quieten down the mind and then thereafter go on the breath or any meditation object. I did continuously as a beginner metta for about eight months. So I can tell you metta alone, if you do it very well, can bring your mind to samadhi. Now, so I was doing Meta almost every day, mind you. And there was one day I had to go to court. And then my associates actually told me, oh, Miss Fu, it's a very difficult case. Chances are you're going to lose it. <laughs> and I was up against a very aggressive and assertive lawyer. So I went to court and I just did Meta. And it was, um, my mind was in a very neutral state. So I went to court. I did my submission. It was a half a day hearing. And thereafter, I still remember the judge. He was, um, after the hearing, he still, he said this to my counsel. Hey, don't be so personal, Mr. So-and-so. Look at Miss Fu. Look, she was, she was submitting with a smile. She's relaxed, you know. You know, try to, try to make this whole court, court atmosphere um, not so tense. And even though I had a very difficult case, it was an application for discovery, I succeeded in half. I mean, I failed in the other half, but no cost work was actually ordered. Now, if I had gone to court because my learned friend is so assertive and aggressive and I was likewise, do you think I am persuasive? My job in court is not to fight with the other lawyer. You know? My job in court is to persuade the judge. And in what better way than to persuade with gentleness, right? A mind of no judgment. Beneficial for my case, beneficial for the judge, because, yeah. And it's the proper time because it was my time. And true, I didn't give evidence from the bar. So these five factors can be applied on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, any other questions? 
Thank you, sister. Next time. Ah, yes. Got, I got any problem, I know who to find. <laughs> but uh, so far, oh, okay. Yeah, we do have one more. Uh, when meeting people we dislike, our body language will be honest and we try to avoid eye contact, etc. So how should we overcome this? Okay, remember the, the meta meditation I led you through? Okay, so if you do meta every day, okay, for beginners, uh, minimum 10 minutes a day, and I would recommend minimum 10 minutes a day every morning, okay? Put your mind back, because the moment you run, you wake up, your mind starts going outside already. What to do next? The mind is really jumping to the future. Anchor your mind back to the present moment using the whole body as a meditation object. And then do meta. And then wish everyone well and think about people you dislike. You've got to wish them well. Maybe very difficult initially, but after a while, you can let go of the aversion. You know how to protect your mind. Okay? So when you see that person in the future, it's very neutral. You don't judge. He is what he is. What he does is his karma. But how you respond determines your own karma, right? So you look after yourself. Lah. So your facial expression will be one that is very neutral, very present. Okay? So, um, so the body language comes from how you think, right? What you think comes out in two ways, what you say and how you act. So you have to go back to the cause. Yes. So slowly. So if you can't, you still have a lot of aversion. Try to avoid the person. Try to avoid. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's that's my best advice. Until you're ready to let go of the aversion, then you can appear in the same circle. Thank you, sister. And yeah. I think the last question we have for the day is um was the meta meditation was the meditation earlier meta meditation? Yes, this is meta. This is meta on what I call a more a mundane way thinking about people, all right? Before you do meta, you, you don't just sit down there and may wish all beings well and happy. Maybe, no, because it comes from a very, what you call that kind of awareness. So uh, what I want you to do before you do meta is that you have to think about a person you love, right? Uh, like your daughter, your son, how do you feel? Get that feeling first, okay? Get that one first and start to think about people you care for because that's easy. And then slowly extend to groups of people that, who are not close and then to people you dislike. This is how you practice. And only after you've practiced this for a while, then you can do the North, South, East, West. If not, nah, the North, South, East, West is just theory, right? It's just words. You've got to evoke it. Huh? A mind. You, a lot of people tell me they prefer to use the children as meditation object because kids, you don't judge your kids, right? Right? Remember the Karaniya Metta Sutta? The Buddha used the example of a mother and child. Even if your child is born autistic, ugly to you, oh, very handsome, very beautiful, I accept you for what you are. Metta is a mind that is totally neutral. Huh? Okay? Yes. All right, and in very Malaysian fashion, we have questions. We have ah. more new questions. Uh, nobody like to ask first one. Everybody like to ask at the end one. Oh. Okay, so how to best how best to explain to my senior staff not to be so bossy? Okay, if you are the boss, it's actually quite easy. All right, to be able to explain to your senior staff, find the right time. The right time should not be during her lunchtime when she has one hour to eat and she needs to rush. Uh, probably at the end of the day where you can tell her and ask her to go back and just reflect. Okay, so if she's angry, she wants to cry, nobody will see it. And you have to speak gently. Are you ready? All right, what you're telling is the truth. Is it beneficial for her? It is because you feel that that will help her. And you speak with a mind with no judgment. Understand that she is what she is, probably thinking that um, become bossy, you get things done. Okay? So that will, that will help you in what you're going to say. You may just start off with praising what you like about her and tell her that, oh, I have something to share with you, which I think can make you even better. Right? So what that mental state, once you get the five factors there, it will guide your speech. Yes. Next, uh, uh? The follow up from just now the about oh. meta meditation. Do you have the link to start practicing the meditation? The link, uh? 
Yeah, on perhaps I, I have website. no idea. Maybe website. the website or maybe a video link. Guided or meditation? Yep, yep, I think. Oh, guided, I, I don't know, no. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, I don't really know. Never mind, maybe we can okay, find yeah. something and yes. we will send to you ourselves, all right? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, um, how our sense restraint can generate a well-spoken words. Yeah. Now, what is sense restraint? Sense restraint is a lot of minor. Uh, if you don't meditate, it's like you see something, chase or it. Hear something, chase or it. Go. So if you practice sense restraint, you let go, let go. You watch the mind. Mind always back to the body. Right? You are always aware of what your mind is thinking and what your body is doing. So your mind is not at what you call automatic cruise control. Like, looping, looping, looping. Then when you're talking to someone, your mind is very quiet. You will have mindful listening and it's very easy to pause before you reply. Sabai, sabai, right? Because you know, right? Uh, you hold back. You, you, yeah. So it's easy. So it's the whole eightfold path is about restraining the mind, letting go. Mental cultivation is keeping the mind quiet. That's why it's very important if you don't have morality, you don't have right speech, right action, right livelihood, it's very hard to practice mental cultivation because you need right effort. Okay? Yes, sense restraint, very important. Minimum, what must do? Five precepts. Can do or not? So if I give you a glass of wine in front of you, can you let go or not? Ha ha. Because if you pause, right, the wine, ah, craving is the mind. It's only the mind. When I drink it, it's bad for my liver because alcohol is a solvent. All right? And can you imagine what it does to the liver? It's a infectant, so we don't drink it. And you know why people drink alcohol, right? Because when they take the first sip and second sip, feels so good. Why? Mind quiet. Because you forget about the past, you don't think about the future, your mind comes to the present moment, body relaxed. Mind quiet, body relaxed. The body breathe on its own. So addictive, right, alcohol? You get that from meditation. Huh? So, and then you drink the alcohol, the third, fourth seat, one glass, two glass, the damage you do to your body. I, I've just read a one whole book on the liver. Let me tell you, it's not funny, okay? The liver protects the body. Um, don't injure it because the liver is the, and the kidneys are protective organs of the body. The moment it's destroyed, you, it's gone. You've got sluggish liver, fatty liver. Because it protects the body, it doesn't give you a signal. It has no nerves there, see? It doesn't mean that it's not injured. That's why when people have diabetes, the moment they have it, they have it. It's really too late. Mm. Okay, next question. Oh, right speech can be beneficial to one, but not another under the same circumstances. Should we proceed with speech? No. All five factors. If it's not beneficial, you know it's not beneficial, don't talk. All right. Simple, straight, direct answer. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, comment. Uh, Dato Victor Wee gives very good oh. meta meditation. Check his YouTube. Also, he gives weekly meditation on BGF Wednesday evening. Yes. Uh, thank you for sharing Dato Victor Wee's talk. It's always good to cross sell here. We appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, try not to be dependent too much on guided. If you can, it's just for beginners, minimum 10 minutes a day, all right, um, to put your mindfulness in the forefront. You use body relaxation first to relax the body, then you go on to metta, and then you go on to your non quieten the mind, meditate. That's already half an hour. So you try to do it every morning, put your mindfulness in the forefront first, and then you start the day. Okay, then you even will remember. When you got out of the bed, which leg got up first? That's mindfulness establishment in the, uh, in the beginning. And then for part-timers, uh, part-timers, you meditate when you're free, only when you remember, only on Saturday or Sunday. Can I propose that you do a minimum 10 minutes in the morning and minimum 10 minutes at night before you sleep? Okay? Relax the body and go to sleep. And for advanced meditators, um, um, it should be an hour a day. Either a sitting an hour or it's morning in uh, half an hour in the morning, half an hour at night. And for those who find it so difficult to meditate because the mind is just so difficult to quieten down because I'd rather be watching my Korean drama serial, I want you to use this. Huh? 
make an appointment to put there on a daily basis, right? You don't miss appointments with friends and relatives. You will not miss an appointment with the Buddha, right? So you go and buy an altar, a beautiful one. You know, when I first started, uh, I tell you, I really prepare, okay? I went to buy a very nice meditation seat. Cost me a few hundred dollars. Uh. And then I, I had a corner with an altar, very sweet, sweet. And it's very modern. Uh, I even purchased a table, which is glass. So that's my corner. Uh, so I told myself, every day, I make an appointment with the Buddha at 7 a.m. every morning. Okay, I put my lamp, I sit there, make it part of your life, put it as part of your practice. This mind, life to life. Spend more time protecting this mind. Okay, spend mind, more time protecting this mind than bathing. This is just body, one life. So if you spend 10 minutes a day bathing, I think more than that, right? Dress, la, moisturize, la, exercise, la, whatever. La, you spend at least 10 minutes on the mind. Okay, encouragement la, mm, to practice. How do we react in argumentative meetings when they are attacking? Okay, when these people are attacking and attacking and attacking. Okay, let's say for example, you okay give you this. You sell goods to your customers, right? You know those salespeople. They are very good at sales. You know, all they care about is the sale. That is the goal, right? No matter how unreasonable la, auntie, uncle, la, You know, it's okay. You know, they talk and talk. They're very kind. They're very gentle. Okay. Why? Because there's no emotional baggage. There's no emotional baggage because you don't judge that person. You don't judge their auntie or uncle. They are ignorant. All right. And then you understand how they feel. You just want to go and have that goal. Now, but if that salesperson is attacked personally, wow, well, you are so dishonest. Ah. You're so dishonest. You go and sell something. He or she may feel a bit unhappy because it's a personal attack. Ego, right? But then if the mind, your goal is what? Your goal is still that end. And that salesman know that if I react in anger, I'm going to finish the deal. What? Right? I'm going to, I'm going to destroy the deal. So that, that salesman knowing what's the goal and don't judge the customer. I'm talking about Buddhist one. I will do mental cultivation salesman. Huh? He will be able to hold back and say, Hey, auntie, you don't want to You know? And auntie will probably say, yeah, yeah, maybe that's not a fair statement. That is using wisdom already. So if you're in a meeting and you're being attacked, so you must ask yourself, are they attacking you personally? Is it personal? Or they're just attacking the words? Sometimes when the ego is very big, right? When someone criticizes your work, you take it as attacking you. Maybe the, the person is talk like this. It's egotism. But you know, what's your end goal? Your end goal is to do this product and do it well. Whether you got to do or not to do or present or not to present, you still have to do right. You might as well do it happily, right? Unhappily also can do, ma. you do it happily. So you protect this mind. And you put in the five factors. Pause. Okay? Okay? And you, you, once you pause, you're able to say that, I understand where you're coming from. Although I don't appreciate the personal attack, but I know that it is unconsciously done. Can I just explain this? See? Uh, you start like that. Lah. Because... That will give you the wisdom. The moment the mind is quiet, wisdom arises. Okay, thank you. This is my two cents worth. Huh? Thank you, sister. Uh, I think that is it. We have no further questions. Maybe okay. we end up our session today with the sharing of Mary. Yes. Okay, so everybody. Um, okay, so we just um, just close our eyes. All right, and um, can you put your mind in a good mental state? Bring your mind back to the body first. You want to share merits, and the merits will be effective uh, if your mind is quiet. Okay. Mind quiet, in Anjali position. By the grace of this merit that I have acquired by our puja, meditation, and learning the Dharma, May I never associate with the foolish, but wise up to the time I attained final happiness. And by the grace of whatever merits that I have acquired, may these be helpful to eradicate the defilements and overcome all suffering. May all the merits I have accumulated today be shared with my family members and my loved ones 
May they be well and happy, and may they continue in the path towards the eradication of suffering. And by the power of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, may all the Dewas protect me, and may they be blessings to me. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.